Good afternoon. Good morning, actually, still, everyone. Um, we, um, we're going to go from the height down to below the ground, right? Um, I will actually only speak for a couple of minutes. I'll pass it to uh, my partner, Alan Popel, who actually uh, took the brunt of the work that we did. We were one of the um, kind of first ones to uh, work on the project together with Adrian, his team, and uh, Thorne Tomasetti. Uh, as you can imagine, um, figuring out what the tower will be based on was very important. And I'll tell you that it was an enormous um, challenge and an honor to be on this. A challenge primarily because, think about it, you are in a part of Jeddah that has uh, geographically and geophysically a very different uh, condition than the main town of Jeddah. And when you think about it, in the geotechnical world, we, we take a lot of information from precedent and what was done before and how previous structures behaved. One thing I'll tell you is that the tallest building that has been built in these geologic formations before was less than 10 stories high. So from that perspective alone, uh, it was solely a challenge. Um, I want to thank Adrian for uh, dragging us with him at the early stages of the uh, competition, together with uh, our friends at Tom Tomaselli. And um, it was a really, really very interesting journey. Our work is done by now, as you, can, as you know, right? Alan, take it on. Thanks, George. Um, just a, a bit of housekeeping before we get uh, too far along. When I say TT, of course, I mean Thornton Tomasetti. If I say Bob, I mean Bob Sin, who is the principal structural engineer for TT. And if I let out a John, that's John Peranto, who is uh, John, uh, Bob's um, senior PM working day to day on the project. So just a shout out to those guys as well. Um, we've seen the rendering before, but just again, we're in Jeddah, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, on the, on the coast of the Red Sea. And just getting straight into it, some building statistics uh, as far as uh, what we foundation guys are worried about. Uh, the building height is more, as you know, is more than 1,000 meters. Uh, the uh, raft area is about 3,200 square meters. Uh, the, it's got a gravity load of about, of about 600, uh, sorry, 860,000 tonnies or about um, 8,600 meganewtons. Total bearing pressure on the raft is about 2.65 MPA. So for those in the English world, it's, uh, it's about 30 tons per square foot on that large raft area. Uh, the, the foundation system is a, is a series or a field of 270 piles uh, at 1.5 meter diameter and uh, two and a half uh, diameters on center with an average um, uh, service load of about 32 meganewtons, so 3,200 uh, tons. And on the raft, it's all covered with a con reinforced concrete raft uh, between four and a half and five meters thick. So just in plan, our, our subsurface investigation program, it's really this dashed line is the Y-shaped outline of the, uh, of the foundation raft. Uh, we had about 13 borings ranging in depth from 120 to uh, 200 meters, right down, the 200 meter guy was right down the center of the raft, so. Uh, and just, just a real quick summary of what uh, all, the, all the boring and geophys uh, in situ testing that was done. Uh, so the geologic profile is basically, it's a couple of, really it's just a couple of meters of, of sand on top of a coralline limestone, uh, which is really coral reef that turned into a limestone over time, and that is about 45 or 50 meters thick. Uh, below that is a two to, twelve, two to 10 meter thick layer of uh, sort of a, a, a mudstone, uh, conglomerate, gravel. Uh, below that is a decomposed or poorly constituted sandstone. At around 100 meters, you have another little of this gravel conglomerate layer, and then finally a much more competent sandstone to the full depth of the borings. Just in, in picture, this is what the uh, coralline limestone looks like. Uh, Let's see if I can get another. Yeah, that's a good shot. I mean, you can see right here, this is the uh, you know, imprint of a shell in that, uh, in that rock formation. Uh, it's, a, it's a soft rock. It's a porous rock. It's, a, it's a specific gravity is on the order of 1.8, which is beach sand is about you know, 1.9. So it's, it's even less dense than a, than a beach sand. Uh, but, it, but very competent. So in other words, uh, very few fractures as we're extracting it out of the ground. 
And then one last thing on the on the limestone, it's uh, you know people when you when you're talking about limestone, you're worried about solution cavities. Uh, we did not see uh, really much evidence or really any evidence of major solution cavities uh, with all the borings and geophysical testing that we, that we performed. So that was a, a good news in all of this. Uh, below this is, the, uh, this is the sort of gravel zone and the, uh, and the mudstone. So these got, whoop, whoops. So this, you know, this gravel here we pulled out at a, at a depth of about 50, 50 to 55 meters. And, and this really, um, you know, sort of dictated a lot of our early thinking about depth of piles. I mean, if you can imagine these, uh, you know, these will act like ball bearings as you're trying to trying to um, uh, carry or extend, excavate a pile through that material. So, it really kind of um, influenced our early thinking. And then there, here's some shots of cores of the uh, more competent sandstone at depth. So just plot of uh, just the, the random sort of randomness of the rock compressive strength. So you have uh, you have um, strength across the top and then elevation, and you've got at least a factor of one to five on the low to high, low to high end, and then similarly on the uh, rock stiffness again rock stiffness on the top going across the top and then with depth, and you've got an order of magnitude difference. And I, I just kind of like to. You know, remind my structural friends in the in the audience that this is sort of the random nature of nature that we're dealing with. So after all this uh, field testing or sort of boring testing, lab testing, we embarked on a field scale, a full scale field load testing uh, to substantiate the rock bearing capacity, to uh, substantiate or, or determine individual bearing uh, pile bearing capacity. Uh, and also look at side unit side shear resistances, uh, unit end bearing, and also the stiffnesses associated with those. And then also uh, constructability. I mean, we draw these nice uh, lines on paper, but you still have to go out and construct it at the end of the day. And uh, a full-scale field load, state, load testing program is a good way to, uh, to really um, prove out or, or, or look at the problems that may, may be associated with construction. So this is a, the footing load test that we performed. I mean, they did this 50 years ago for the world, original World Trade Center. Uh, my predecessors, predecessors at Illinois uh, were, were involved with that, and it's kind of like the joke with, you know, if you're from Illinois and you work on the world's tallest building, you kind of have to do a footing load test. So we did one. No, no, we got a little good information out of it too, and, and it was nice that the rock was so shallow. So we excavated down a couple of meters. Uh, this thing is 1.5 meters square by 1.7 meters thick. So we're able to get a load settlement curve uh, like this. So we've got um, load on this axis and settlement on this, this axis. We converted it to a pressure. We figured we mobilized about 3.3 MPA um, in, in bearing pressure. And you kind of co contrast that with the undrained shear, or sorry, the um, uh, unit axle compressive strength of the rock cores. We're right about, averaged right about the same value. So we're really mobilizing a, a bearing capacity pretty equal to the, uh, to the unit axial compressive strength of the rock cores. Next is uh, we performed um, load tests. Uh, this is uh, a, just a schematic of what the pile looks like. Uh, we had two tiers of uh, O cells. We used O cells by load test, which were which are fantastic, uh, just a fantastic piece of technology uh, invented about 25 years ago by George Osterberg, and they're really embedded. Um, hydraulic uh, jacks with plates, and you're able to push up, to, up against the pile and down against the pile. It really mobilized tremendous capacities uh, without having to worry about doing a top-down test with reaction piles or, or dead loads. Uh, so it's really a great, really efficient way to, to um, test for high capacities in piles. So we had two tiers uh, and um, just some shots of uh, the, the load test program. This is the cage getting strung up, a 45 meter uh, high cage. Uh, this is the excavation bucket. Uh, the, um, we, we lucked out again with the pilot in the sense with the, the, the rock is soft, so you're able to, they were able to excavate it with really just rock cutting teeth on the end of the, end of the uh, mucking bucket. And then this is a shot of the uh, O cell. There's a, I forget, two or three of, of these cells embedded into the re, uh, rebar cage. Uh, so that's what it looks like, sort of embedded into the pile. So with that, we're able to draw, uh, in this case, this is, uh, uh, this is a unit side shear with, with uh, deformation. So you can see it about anywhere from two to five millimeters 
of uh, strain, we're getting ultimate side shears of at least 500 uh, kPa, if not more. Same thing up here. So this is a this is kind of well this plot I could spend 30 minutes talking about this plot, but uh, just one thing that's telling you is uh, this is a modulus of deformation again on the top versus depth. One thing it's telling us is that there's a there's a pretty significant reduction in deformation modulus as you as you uh, go with depth. So this is the upper coralline limestone, and then this is sort of that poorly constituted sandstone at depth. And so again, it, it doesn't, the, the ground doesn't necessarily get better with depth. Sometimes it gets worse, gets, sometimes it gets softer, and, uh, and that's what happened here. Uh, these diamonds, that guy there, those two guys, and these two guys were the back calculated modulus of deformation from the, uh, from the actual full scale field load test. So you can see it, it sort of fits into the, into the overall um, uh, zone. This, this, uh, whoops. This uh, shaded zone is sort of the, the, um, you know, the, the uh, design values that we were looking at, a range of design values that we were looking at for deformation modulus. All right, so now we have all this great information, and now we embark onto our foundation design. Uh, and of course, we're designing up until this point as well, but you know, now we're really uh, starting the full, uh, the, uh, the final stages of it. So again, first is looking at, uh, just general bearing capacity of the of the limestone bedrock. We we chickened out a little bit, and we ended up taking a two and a half um, MPA as the ultimate uh, bearing capacity, and then put, putting uh, factors of safety of two and a half and three on it, depending on whether it's sort of static loads or or transient loading. And uh, and you can see the allowable bearing capacities that were uh, the range that we're looking at. You know, just either side of one MPA, or about uh, ten tons per square foot. Or uh, ultimate side shear of a pile, we took, instead of 500, we took 450 kPa for a 45 meter deep uh, pile. Again, we're keeping it in the coralline limestone. We're trying to avoid that gravel below it. Uh, but we're also, we wanted to go through the, pretty much extend the full depth of the limestone because in case there were some solution cavities that we didn't necessarily find, we figured, hey, at least we'll be able to bridge through them or, and or we'll fill them up as we're concreting the piles. Again, the piles are two and a half uh, times diameter, so they're really, I mean, if you look at it at a block, we're replacing about 12 or 13 percent of that block of volume of, of rock with concrete. So, uh, and then, uh, so our calculated uh, geotechnical capacities are, two, uh, are 42 meganewtons, so 4,200 tons, and, uh, and 50 meganewtons. And co contrast that with our 32 M uh, meganewton uh, for the average, uh, Average pile capacity or average service load on the pile, and you know we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. So the next thing we take that information, we created a soil structure international finite element model, soil structure interaction model of the of the foundation. So it's the piles, it's the ground, of course, and it's the raft. So what we do is we we're modeling the raft as a as the thickness and the uh, and giving it the um, the uh, strength and stiffness proper properties from TT, and uh, and they're obviously taking care of everything above that, the, the structure above it. So I guess just a reminder on the, on, the, uh, on the general configuration of the pile foundation. And just uh, take a step back, and uh, there's no equations in this talk, but uh, just sort of concepts. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, the rock really is acting like an elastic medium for the most part. Everything I'm going to show you is, uh, is linear elastic uh, solutions. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you've got a flexible beam on, foundation, uh, beam on elastic foundation. So what happens is you get a fairly non-uniform settlement profile, and uh, whoops, uh, and then a, but a fairly uniform pressure below the raft. Uh, the other extreme, of course, is a is a infinitely rigid foundation uh, beam on elastic foundation. Uh, so this guy wants to it's it's rigid, right? So it's going to settle the same amount, but you get a very non-uniform um, response in the in the rock or, or soil medium, and uh, you know you've seen the you've seen the renderings, you see the uh, you know you see the model back there, and you can you could probably pretty quickly guess that it's going to be acting more like a, more like a rigid foundation than uh, than a flexible one. So our soil structure action uh, soil structure soil structure interaction model has uh, again it's got the raft geometry, the rock modulus, uh, linear elastic the location and geometry of the piles, 
and then all the strength and stiffness parameters in there. And of course, we like to think that it's, a, we don't like to think it is, it's an iterative process really between uh, geotechnical and, and structural engineers. So what will happen is that the structural engineer will take, um, in this case, DT took, uh, you know, took, took a load takedown based on a flexible foundation, but flexible with uniform sp springs uh, from, from center to edge. Uh, we get the wall loads. Uh, we, we come up with a, uh, with a deformation of the raft. We calculate springs. Uh, that goes back into their model. And then we go back and forth until we hopefully shake hands and have convergence. So this is courtesy of TT, but just a, a shot of what the um, structural system looks like near the foundation. Uh, triangular uh, core walls, series of wing walls that come uh, down each wing and walls, and then fin walls that, um, and the, these guys taper up, the fin walls drop off as you go up the, up the tower. But again, the, the wing walls are, they go the full height of the tower. So, and, and you see from the rendering that the, the different legs drop off at, at different heights, but it's, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's an 800 meter to 1,000 meter high uh, shear, you know, shear walls, continuous walls. Uh, this would be a shot of the foundation. Um, these guys, all these circles are the, uh, uh, the piles in there. So I'm missing, ah, here we go. So what we did was we sort of divided it up into four areas, uh, the middle area and the three legs. And you can see just from a total load in, they're fairly, these, these are fairly, uh, fairly um, equal areas. And you can see that the loads are fairly equal so that it's, uh, it's really being uh, loaded fairly uniformly. So again, we take those wall loads. We modeled them actually as, as individual points, even for the walls. But but that's what our the, the top of our model looked like. Uh, again, the model of uh, of the ground. It's our model is three meters, three hundred meters in uh, s uh, square and plan area, and then two hundred meters deep. And then just for your finite element wonks, that's this is what it looks like in section with the with the meshing. Uh, so this was our first cut. Uh, you know, first twenty. 45 meter deep piles. Our first cut was uh, 170, basically 175 millimeter settlement at the middle and uh, almost 100, 110 millimeters at the edge. You know, if you look at it, it's about um, 57 meters from center to edge. So that pencils out to an angular rotation of, of about one on 900. And, you know, we thought we were doing pretty well, actually. Uh, we started to iterate with uh, TT, and things were not going very well. well we, weren't, we weren't getting convergence, and we were getting, uh, their, their models weren't looking like our models, and they were actually getting reverse curvature. And uh, we realized at that point something was, something was not right. Uh, this is, happens to be my favorite plot of, one of my favorite plots of the whole job. So this, again, this is our uh, rigid foundation, uh, rigid uh, beam on elastic foundation. And this is a, a plot across the top of uh, pile loads and, and, and uh, stresses beneath the raft versus, uh, you know, increased uh, load on the piles. So if this is, the, this is the center of the raft, that's the edge. So basically pile loads are, instead of 32 meganewtons all the way across, we're like five here and like 50 down here. And you can see it's, you know, it's got this hyperbolic shape like this does. And, uh, and that's really what was happening. We, we, had, a, we had an issue that, um, you know, the, the, the foundation itself was, was too flexible for the, uh, for the stiffness of the tower. Uh, TT was seeing that in the wall loads as well. They were starting to get, uh, wall loads were increasing by several factors, um, starting at about, I forget about the 10th or 8th or 10th floor, and, uh, and again, just really not workable at all. Uh, so the solution, of course, is, was to stiffen up the foundation or stiffen up the rock, and we did that by uh, taking piles down the center, uh, down to a, whoops, down to uh, 105 meters overall. We wanted to stay about five, 10 meters, five, 10 meters above that more competent sandstone. We didn't want to have hard, a hard point in the middle of the raft, but we wanted to, we wanted to take the piles down there for really for uh, reinforcement of the ground. Uh, the, the, the wings stayed at 45, and then we stepped them down just so we didn't have such an abrupt change from 45 down to 105. So we went 45, 75, 85, and, and 105. Again, just a shot of uh, what the revised model looks like. And then here's, our, uh, here's where we started. Again, the first load takedown, instead of 175 in the center, we're 107. And we're 86 at the edge. One, two, three iterations, we were done. 
And that really tells you how, how stable the, the foundation was with, with the deeper piles. This is Bob, Bob Sin's favorite, uh, one of his favorite plots of the, of the oh, actually, I take it back. This is, that's the next one. This one is the converged model between, uh, between Langan and, and TT. Ours is on this side and, and TT's is on this side. Now, does this mean that the, uh, the, you know, the maximum settlement's gonna be in the middle is gonna be exactly 100 meters? Of course not, we're not that good. Uh, but what it is telling you is that we, we have compatibility. We have, a, we have a structural model and a geotechnical model that are compatible. And no matter how it operates, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, if it's less or if it's more, at least they're going to act uh, in a predictable, predictable manner. I've got five minutes left. All right. I can make it. Uh, so this is Bob's favorite plot. This is the first, uh, first cut, um, just again, all the 45 meter pile and then the, uh, and then the tapered pile with depth. And it's just, again, you could just see how much more stable this one is, uh, uh versus this guy. Uh, convergence on loads, I mean, again, we're, we're 35, we're within one or two meganewtons on every single, we modeled every single pile in the, in the field and, and we're within one or two meganewtons on all piles. Uh, this is uh, my brain after, no, no, this is, uh, this is um, uh, the, the plot of the uh, pressures below the raft. And again, it's very uniform except for getting out at the edges. We had some, some increases at the edges. Yeah, we'll go by that one. Uh, TT saw that a little bit in their model as well. They said they had uh, some increase on the edge, but not not dramatic and not uh, not something that couldn't couldn't be overcome. And then again, this is the pile scheme, uh, the pile loads from before, you know, hyperbolic almost in shape. And again, the the, the actual solution that's been built is uh, very uniform over here. Some shots of the. Of the uh, of the construction, I think these are mostly from John Peranto, uh, but the piles. Uh, just a sort of a standaway shot of the raft under construction. A little bit closer view. I mean, this is just it's five minute, five meters thick. I mean, these are half meter shear keys in there. So just to give you a sense of the scale. Rebar reinforcement, and then uh, you know, final remarks. I think that uh, really the the biggest thing is that the uh, the, the foundation. Uh, really has to be as stiff as the as the structure. If, if you have a foundation system or, or ground condition that's too flexible for the foundation for the tower, uh, you're going to run into problems, which is which is what we did initially, and um, that, that's that's really the, one of the main takeaways for me. Uh, and then I wanted to leave with this one. I couldn't forget uh, Caldoun, so our, I was also in memory of our colleague Dr. Cal Caldoun Fahum, who was our Middle East manager uh, when this project started. And really, he's the one who introduced, introduced our firm to, to uh, Adrian Smith, Adrian and Pete, and all the guys. And uh, unfortunately, he, he passed away a, a little bit over a year ago. But uh, you know, we do this in memory of him as well. And with that, I will leave it to Pete.